I'm Matt McClure. And I'm Francesca Maxime, and this is Currents. The early bird gets the worm. A unique look at how valuable your time is. If you're not punctual and you've made plans with people, then you're not living up to your word. Plus, Sunday, Advent, and Lent, and what it all means. It's important for individuals to be able to take control, to take control of how they're going to spend the holidays. And we go into the deep to talk more about Advent. It is a period of, of, of preparation to absorb the great uh, understanding of what the Incarnation means in the birth of Christ. Well, good evening. Thanks so much for joining us. The day after Thanksgiving is about more than just recovering from all the turkey, the stuffing, and the cranberry sauce. I know I'm still doing that, but today is Black Friday, and for many that means an early morning that starts on those Christmas sales, getting up just before the crack of dawn and going out and trying to find all those bargains. Or getting well, them online. Right, <laughs> yes, yes, that too. Well, according to a new poll from Consumer Reports, the average person spends 15 hours shopping for gifts. No doubt. That poll also shows they expect to spend another 15 hours gathering with family and friends and attending parties. But how do we organize our time, especially around the holidays? What should we be thinking about? Earlier this year, our Natalia Ortiz had a chance to explore those questions. I'm here with Phil Fox Rose in a clock shop, and he is a columnist of Busted Halo. He's here to talk to us about the spirituality of being on time. Thank you so much for being with us, Phil. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. So what is the link between spirituality and punctuality? Well, I, I, I put it into two categories. Um, there's reality and honesty. Mm -hmm. uh, the principle of, you know, let your yes be, mean yes and your no mean no. Okay. That, that uh, if you're not punctual and you've made plans with people, then you're not living up to your word. Um, and the other part of it is, is reality. That's, that's the way I see it, is, is accepting reality the way it is and re dealing with reality the way it is. So if you make a plan that doesn't make sense, um, then you're trying to defy reality in a sense. You're trying to defy the way things are. So is it a sin to be tardy? <laughs> I think That's there's, what the audience really wants yeah. to know, really. <laughs> there, there's no simple answer to that. I think, okay. I think uh, you know, sometimes it is, sometimes okay. it isn't. Uh, I mean, but there's a lot of, there's a lot of range here because, because a lot of times when people are late, it's a mixture of, of factors. Right. And if you have your best intentions, but you have a tendency to not quite pull it together, that might be a character flaw, but I don't know if I'd call it a sin. Um, but if you're making plans with people that you really don't have a serious intention of following through on, then, then you're really being dishonest directly. Interesting. Yeah. Can someone who's chronically late fix that? Can they change? Absolutely. I mean, first of all, as, I, as I've said when I've, I've written about this, I, I am the first person to talk about this because it's been a problem my whole life. Okay. Um, and, and I'd say, as, as is true with many of the issues that I write about that have to do with kind of living well, um, it's, a, it's, it's a two-fold thing, it's a, it's a two-sided thing. One is the behavior modification, the, the ethics, doing the right thing because it's the right thing to do. But alongside that, you also could be doing spiritual work to change yourself. You actually, at some point down the road, don't need to be kind of controlling your behavior. You're actually, your first impulse is to do the right thing. Okay. And, and it's not perfect in me yet, but uh, you know, I used to be chronically late and didn't realize it was a problem. All the, all the character defects possible were, were involved in it. And nowadays, I have a little trouble sometimes getting it all together, and, and I <laughs> fall short a little bit. But, but I know what the right thing to do is, and I intend to do the right thing. And that's not a constant vigilant thing day to day for me anymore because I've done the spiritual work to change myself interiorly. Okay, that makes sense. And I think a lot of people don't understand uh, what, how they affect other, others when they're late. How would you describe that? Yeah, and I think that's one of the common flaws, you could say, in, in people who are chronically late is they aren't even considering the impact of what they're doing. You know, the first most obvious thing is that that person has changed their schedule, blocked out time to be with you, and you're wasting their time. Um, you're inconveniencing them. Whereas you know you're late, and so you might be catching up on email on, on your phone or something, they're sitting there waiting for you to show up, and they don't know whether you're going to be five minutes late or 20 minutes late. So they, they can't really start another project. You know, and just in the broadest sense, as far as just, you know, the damage we cause by, by unethical behavior, it, 
they're losing respect for us. They're losing trust in people being on time. We're just causing that kind of snowball like a effect. A domino effect, yeah, yeah. yeah, okay. Well, thank you so much for being with us today. We've run out of time, unfortunately, speaking of it, but I hope you can come back soon. Thanks for having me, it's great to be here. Okay. Some food for thought there to enjoy with your leftovers. <laughs> I know it's always good to try to be on time. Of course, not everybody may be ready for all the shopping and gift giving. In fact, they may be singing the holiday blues. Indeed, and when we return though, some advice on overcoming that. Welcome back. Chicago Blues, Texas Blues, Memphis Blues. <laughs> How about holiday blues? Yeah. <laughs> We're not talking about Christmas music here, but depression, really. Yeah, right. It uh, can really crop up around this time of year. Yes, and during this time of year when many people are celebrating and making merry, many other people out there might actually be not in such a festive mood. Maybe there's some family you don't get along with. There's Maybe that. you've even lost a family member, perhaps, and the holidays are just a reminder of all the stress and the grief. They very much can be, but there is some help out there. Last year, I had a chance to speak with Sherry Schachter. She's the director of bereavement services at Calvary Hospital. Sherry Schachter, director of bereavement services at Calvary Hospital. Thanks so much for being with us today. Thank you for having me. Here on Currents. Now, we know that uh, Calvary does advertise in the tablet, which is, uh, this is uh, last Sunday's version. And um, one of the things in here as well is our uh, own Dr. Stephen Garner. He did a little column here about uh, sort of depression over the holidays and people that sort of feel overwhelmed and have a lot of um, trouble sometimes dealing with it. And uh, that's what we're here to talk a little bit about is how do you deal with the holidays? I'm going to be driving home to Boston. I don't love everybody in my family the way that I probably should because sometimes they drive me nuts. Uh, but, you know, I have found ways over the years to sort of deal with that. How do you think people you know, what, what's your advice to deal with some troubled relatives, if you will? Well, I think the first thing you have to realize is to, to recognize that holidays are very stressful. They're very stressful times of year. And we tend to think that the, everything is wonderful and we think back on holidays with family and friends and everything was perfect. But the reality is it's not always perfect, even in the best of times when, you know, one aunt doesn't talk to another aunt or mm. difficulty with family relationships. And when someone is grieving, when someone has had a recent loss or even a loss that perhaps is not so recent, holidays bring up expectations that we have and that's what causes the stress. So it's important for individuals to be able to take control, to take control of how they're going to spend the holidays. So how would they take control? Are there things they can do now before Thanksgiving or before Christmas or New Year's or whatever it is, um, as well as things that they can do during the actual day when they're with the people? Absolutely. Uh, I like to think of four C's, and the first one is to be able to, um, to, con to, to control your situation. Plan in advance what you're going to do, what you're not going to do. For someone, for example, that's newly bereaved, they are not up to decorating the tree, for example, mm -hmm. or, or ha perhaps having the Christmas that they've had in the past, rituals that they've done in the past. And so it's acknowledging we don't have the energy or the desire to celebrate Christmas this way. Sure. And so this is what I'm not going to do. So you have to, to make do. your own decision. That's your control part. So M Make your own decision, but also consult with family members, okay. especially uh, children. If someone is a bereaved spouse, for example, and has children, you want to include your children and your teenagers in the decision also, because they're part of the, fa not only are they part of the family, but th their grief needs to be acknowledged and heard as well. Okay. But once you compromise another C once okay. you compromise on what you think might be helpful for you then you want to implement that you want to communicate that to the rest of the family okay so communicate then that's your action item so that Absolutely. takes you out and then says this is what we're going to do I've considered all of the above myself and you included and this is the plan and also have not only plan A, but plan B. Right. So if, <laughs> if you wake up and plan A just doesn't feel right, you switch to plan B. And I, I think it's very important. One of the things that I try and tell family members is that to limit your expectations and to limit your activities so that you're not 
exhausting yourself. What about people that have a hard time sort of saying no and they feel like they're obliged and perhaps the thing is supposed to go from 2 p.m. to 10 p.m.? Can they just say, well, I'll be there from 2 to 4 and that's it? Well, one of the, one of the, uh, the things I think for the bereaved in particular, but actually for anyone, is to be able to take your own car. So mm -hmm. start with your own transportation, whether it's your own car or a taxi service, whichever way you're going to use. So you're not dependent on someone else to take you You can get there. out when you need to you, if you've had enough. If you feel enough. after an hour and a half yeah. you had enough, then you leave. Yeah. Another thing that's helpful is when people invite you, say for Thanksgiving dinner, to say, is it okay if I let you know that morning? I don't know how I'm going to feel when I wake up. I don't know if it's going to be too much for me. Right. Chances are, if someone is making Thanksgiving dinner, you're one person, you're the, two people at the most. Yep. Yeah, it's okay if you're going to. Absolutely. Gonna, so we have the control and we have the, the uh, communication and, and the action plans. And, and it sounds as though um, for people who are recently bereaved, it's particularly uh, perhaps a challenging time, but there are some things that they can do to plan ahead and also that day to kind of take control of their environment. Well, that sounds great. I will um, talk a little bit more about this on our blog and uh, let people know a few of the tips that you shared with us today. And for now, thanks so much for uh, sharing with us all this year. You're quite welcome. Happy Thank you for having me. <laughs> <laughs> you too. <laughs> Yeah, it's tough sometimes. I mean, you know, I was just speaking with some friends over the weekend that have just lost some folks um, to cancer, and uh, this is going to be the first holiday without some of their loved ones, and it's really hard, and, uh, you know, they're going to need to take things at their own pace. Yeah, I remember a couple of Christmases ago, a, a dear friend of mine uh, had lost his father earlier that year, and that was so his mother and his first Christmas time without uh, his dad, and that was just really difficult for them. So, yeah, a lot of struggles that go on there, but I think the, the big one, kind of the main point of all of that was the the first C, the control. Mm -hmm. You know, kind of take control even in, you know, the, the thing where, as you know, she says, take your own uh, transportation right. to an event or something like that. It all comes kind of back to that control and, and kind of taking control of the own, your own situation. Yeah, don't expect that you can take in everything so that you can leave when you need to. Yeah. Well, stay tuned. There's much more current straight ahead. Coming up, three things to think about heading into the Advent season. Control your situation. Plan in advance what you're going to do, what you're not going to do. Well, in all the excitement of looking for gifts and preparing meals, the meanings behind Christmas, Advent, and other religious seasons can get lost. They can. Last year, St. John's University gave people an opportunity to get reacquainted with those meanings when it hosted a talk on Advent, Lent, and Sunday. It's part of the school's series of three things talks in which three church topics are discussed. <laughs> we send our cameras to check it out. Sunday is really the, you might say, key holy day in the liturgical year. I mean, sometimes some people will refer to it as the weekly Easter. I would want to nuance that a little bit because it's more than just the weekly Easter, it's also the weekly Pentecost. And of course, there are a number of other themes that are important to every Sunday. That perhaps Sunday has probably gotten lost in this notion of the weekend. And as a result, perhaps we've lost some real sense for the sacredness of Sunday as a day on its own. And then part of that also has to do with maybe an overly, at times, relaxed approach to celebrating the Eucharist among Catholics especially. Well, I think Advent is a season, okay, in preparation for Christmas. Um, we have to be careful not to lose Advent because we go right into Christmas. Christmas, there's no problem with because everyone celebrates Christmas. The other seasons are important, especially for Christians, the season of Lent, 40 days of prayer and fasting. Easter is the season in which we celebrate uh, Jesus rising from the dead. So these are very important days for Christians. We celebrate them each year, and there's a cycle of beginning and end. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, our, everything we do here would be pointless. People know that intellectually, but they don't celebrate that in their lives. And we think of it as a moment, as someone said here today, because we're just, you know, we're a fast-paced society. We think Easter is a moment. He rose, okay, on with the next thing. But actually, he is risen. He is risen. He is among us when we gather together. The seasons of the year 
are just are used and they become, they become part of the ordinary culture. They become much more secularized. So Christmas has become secularized. Easter has become secularized to a certain extent. It's not that it's a bad thing that the, that the whole society knows that Christmas is coming and Easter is coming, but the religious values which undergird Christmas and Easter, sometimes they don't get the kind of attention that they need to. Four times during the course of the year, twice in a semester, we run three of these talks around a particular theme. So for example, we had a talk last May, three talks on Mary. And then earlier this semester, we had three talk talks on priesthood for the year for priests. And the three talks today were all around liturgical year. I think it's very inspiring and very factual. Uh, he, he's, he talks in a, a, a language that everybody understands. And it's a very interesting topic, liturgical year. And it's something that you live with on Sunday to know what it's all about. And it's very spiritual. And I, I, I feel that he, uh, the way he presents it and the whole program is very beneficial and I, I'm very glad I came. I think they are actual topic that interests all Catholics. The, like I said, is a continuing education for me. I came today, you know, to deepen my knowledge, to know better the faith, live it and be able to spread it. The liturgical season is our liturgical life, okay? There are five seasons, Advent, Christmas, um, Lent, Easter, Ordinary Time, and we celebrate the Paschal Mystery. Each season celebrates something about Jesus' uh, life, death, and resurrection. For example, Advent celebrates uh, the coming of God born in history. Christmas celebrates the birth of Christ. So each of the seasons is connected somehow uh, to uh, who Jesus is for us. Jesus is born at Christmas as our Savior and Messiah. So it's not just about the big holidays themselves, Christmas, Easter. It's about the preparation, about the leading up to it as well that you, it sometimes gets overlooked, I think. Well, they mentioned uh, Sundays. I remember my grandfather worked two jobs in a factory, and then he was a stonemason. But Sunday he did, I don't want to say he didn't do anything, but it really was a sacred, special day. Right. It was a little bit of family time, but it was his day to really, you know, go to church, spend time visiting family, visiting friends, and sort of taking in and taking stock. And that was one way that I think that he really incorporated that kind of preparation time, because that sort of gave him his fuel for the rest of the week when he really had to, you know, do some tough stuff and work really hard. Yeah, yeah. So, so it's not only during uh, Advent and Lent and those type seasons, you know, you just uh, can, you know, be in preparing, that state mm -hmm. of preparing all year long. Absolutely. Well, to find out about upcoming Three Things Talks at St. John's, head over to our blog where we've posted some more information there and some links as well. Go to CurrentsNY.net and click on Writing the Wave. And stay tuned. There's more Currents straight ahead. When we return, more on Advent as we go into the deep. The Advent read is a good family uh, way of, of celebrating Advent, but I would, which I would recommend. Well, finally tonight, we just heard a little bit about the meanings of Advent and Christmas as part of the Three Things talks here on the show, but we want to take a closer look now at the season that gets underway this weekend, Advent. Advent is a time to prepare, and not just for parties and for gift, get, gift giving. That is what I talked about with Bishop DiMarzio as we went into the deep. Bishop DiMarzio, thank you so much for joining us today on Currents. Um, we're talking about Advent, and talk to us about what the significance of Advent is, because a lot of times people feel like it is sort of starting now around the Thanksgiving time. Well, Advent is the four weeks before Christmas, four Sundays, uh, some of the fourth week, sometimes not a full week. But it is a time of preparation uh, for Christmas, a spiritual preparation. Many times, unfortunately, people confuse it as a penitential season like Lent is for, for Easter. Mm. It's different. It's not a penitential season, but it is a period of, of a, a preparation to absorb the great uh, understanding of what the Incarnation means and the birth of Christ. So it is a, a, a time of uh, spiritual uh, preparation, uh, uh, but not in the penitential sense, but more in the, the sense of wanting to grow in our faith. Okay, and, and so in order to grow and, and deepen that spiritual presence, what are some of the things people can do during Advent to prepare? I think spiritual reading is one of the key things. You know, that usually is things we think, a thing we find difficult to do. Reading the scriptures, I think those are the two main things that can give you preparation for, for Christmas to understand the 
Redemption, the Incarnation. There's many, many good books available. Um, so I think that would be the advice I would give. Hmm. Well, you know, we do live in a market-driven society, and so we hear Christmas music coming on the radio, mm. perhaps even as early as after Halloween or after <laughs> Thanksgiving, and, and, and it certainly um, can help put us in the mood, but I'm not sure if it entirely prepares us for everything. I, I, is this a right way to, you know, sort of uh, embrace with anticipation um, the coming Christmas holiday? Are there other things that we can do? Well, the commercialization of Christmas has been happening for many, many years now, uh, more than, uh, than ever. And again, the spiritual side has to be kept separate. We, we can't make our preparation for Christmas, buying our Christmas gifts, running our Christmas cards, although that's all important part. There's, there's more to it. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's deeper than that. So uh, to keep that in mind, uh, and uh, you have to do everything, I think, uh, because it is a, a major family celebration as well as a religious celebration. But um, keeping things separate, putting the spiritual side in will temper the other things. Do you think that we've lost somehow this sense of Advent, this sense of anticipation? Uh, and to a point because of all of the commercialization, but uh, people who are faithful Catholics who are practicing, they know, they, they follow the liturgy, they, they're able to um, separate things out. Are there specific things that um, somebody can maybe do with their family that you might recommend? Yeah, I think, um, you know, this Advent wreath is a very important thing for families. It focuses the attention of the children and the adults on that. Another week has passed. And, mm. uh, so I think that the Advent wreath is a good family uh, way of, of celebrating Advent. But I would, which I would recommend. Okay. All right. Well, Bishop DiMarzio, thank you so much for joining us. You're welcome. I always love making an advent wreath. Yeah. We'd go to the store, get special ribbons, velvet ribbons, pink and purple, and, you know, go cut down things in the yard for, you know, making the wreath. And yeah. Yeah, it was, a nice, it was a nice tradition. Yeah, it's always a very nice tradition. And all, of course, is that, you know, building of the anticipation leading up to uh, the celebration of Christmas and, you know, the, the acknowledgement and celebration of the birth of Christ and all of that, and which, of course, is uh, what December 25th is about each year as it rolls around. And I can't believe that we're already at the day after Thanksgiving. And it's uh, less than a month away now. Happening very quickly. Yes. <laughs> that is all for this edition of Currents. Be sure to check us out online at CurrentsNY.net. And you can also follow us on Facebook and on Twitter. For all of us here at Currents, I'm Francesca Maxime. And I'm Matt McClure. Thanks so much for watching. Have a great night and a great weekend.